I'm getting my stuff. Okay, I don't know how my technology is holding up because it's not doing well here. Great day. Okay, okay. I don't know how my technology is holding up out there. Put something in the chat. Let me know if my technology is holding up out there. If you all are able to see my technology. Okay. Seems like I'm getting something here. Okay, grace to you. I'm Dr. Jonathan Alvarado. I'm here in uh, in Southern California, Costa Mesa, California, uh, at the Society for Pentecostal Studies meeting, and I wanted to reach out to each and every one of you. Good. Internet is choppy list. We miss you, sis. Wish you were here. We had a great meeting, diversity committee meeting, and uh, they acknowledged your contribution to the manifesto. I want you to know that. And uh, and I missed you at the uh, the uh, 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 Doctora Loida uh, Mar uh, Martes or Marteles, uh, who presented uh, on yesterday. The plenary speaker was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so yeah, hey, weigh in. Let me know where you're where you're viewing from. I'm already eight minutes in, and I apologize for holding you all uh, for not getting in as soon as I possibly could. I was doing three or four things at once, mostly trying to get the internet to connect to the ethernet cable that's in my room, but it gives me an ethernet signal. My computer recognizes it, but it's, it's not doing it. Yes, uh, yes, Loyla Matel Otero, she was fantastic. Fantastic, just just a tremendous presentation uh, and uh, covered a gamut of issues that Pentecostals must be concerned with in the future. So, so, um, uh, we'll see you all. We'll see you. Uh, I know we'll see you in uh, 2023 at Oral, Oral Roberts University. We hope to see you 2023, the Lord wills, at uh, in Oral Roberts University. Others of you, weigh in, let me know, uh, 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 coming in from Houston and others. I know this is a special lunch edition, and I know some of you all were not anticipating GPP at this time of the day, but I didn't want it to pass by. And tonight's GPP is going to be late. Tonight's will be late. Nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time, eight o'clock Central Time, something around that wise. Because here it's uh, I've got a meeting from four to five thirty or so, and um, and there's a uh, banquet afterward. I probably won't attend the banquet, but um, but uh, right during the time when we we would be starting GPP seven thirty Eastern Standard Time, we four thirty uh, Pacific Time. And I'll be engaged, and so I won't be able to do it. So I'll try to be in front of the camera, try to be up in front of you, and try to have a better uh, internet connection. Though I, I hear you all saying that uh, that the that the technology is at least holding up. I've got my iPad as a monitor over here, and it seems like um, it's coming across the internet. Uh, it's a little bit choppy, but uh, but um, uh, but it is coming through. Blessings to you, uh, 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 Ken from Chicago, and Fred Lewis from Houston, and and uh, Liz Rios from. Uh, Florida and uh, Elder G coming in from uh, uh, Decatur or Atlanta, uh, uh, the metropolitan Atlanta area. Good. I'm happy to see each and every one of you. Thank you for joining me on GPP on this morning here, early afternoon in some places where you are. I want you to know this is I'm, I'm, I'm here with the Society for Pentecostal Studies. It is an academic conclave of men and women of like passion and interest in Pentecostal studies, all things Pentecostal, Pentecostal theology, Pentecostal missiology, Pentecostal um, um, practical theology and, and spiritual formation, um, worship, all, all facets and, and, and uh, diverse uh, kind of iterations of Pentecostal spirituality are being explored here and then even um, resourced here by way of uh, human resources connecting people that have similar passion, interest in research areas, as well as uh, solutions. And people that have researched things, found uh, uh, answers to problems, and it's, it's a wonderful way to be able to engage with the broader community. And it also provides the kind of platform and, uh, and a forum whereby we can uh, all, whereby we can connect with one with the other and expand the Pentecostal footprint in the academic community. And so um, I'm here. I'm enjoying the meeting. Good, uh, good day, Colette Walker. So good to see you. Um, it's been a it's been a great great. I flew in late Wednesday night. I was where I was in sessions all day on Thursday from morning to night, and then on today, uh, I uh, on. Um, Today is Saturday. On yesterday, I was in sessions all day up until the mid-afternoon. Then I jumped on a train and went down to San Diego. I had to go see about my godson and family. 
And so I went th- went there. I took a train at 5.30 this morning, got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, got on a train at 5.30, got back here into town, had a couple of meetings and things I had to take care of this morning, got back into town about 8 o'clock or so. And so now it's 10.14 here, but I wanted to make sure that I reached out because I told you, uh, in addition to my Facebook posts, some of you all have seen some of my Facebook posts and responded. So if you haven't, go to my Facebook page, like, share, subscribe, uh, publicize this uh, uh, broadcast, put something, make a comment of some sort. Just tell me that you're here. Tell me that you um, that you are, are viewing. Tell me uh, anything. Just encourage uh, me and 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 jar the analytics by um, by uh, engaging somewhere in the comments, in the stream, in the chat. Okay, because we won't be before you long. Because I've got to hasten to the next meeting. I've got to be in a meeting in the next forty minutes or so, and so I'm only about ten minutes from the from the campus of Vanguard University where the meeting is being is taking place. But I've got to be in the next meeting, and so I wanted to reach out to you. Wanted to let you know what we're doing. This is what we're studying this year. We're looking at. Uh, New Approaches to Pentecostalism. It's called Advancing the Study of Pentecostalism, New Directions and Future Possibilities. That's our program for this year. So all of the lectures, all of the uh, papers that are being presented, all the panel discussions, all the books and things that we're reviewing and and, and seeing together are uh, indeed being uh, centering around the theme of, of new directions and uh, uh, future possibilities for Pentecostalism. And so uh, our plenary speaker on Thursday night was my friend, Dr. Antipas Harris, who spoke on the African-American Pentecostal preacher as public theologian, Pentecostal power in social justice. So any of you all that know anything about me know uh, uh, know that that was, that was really, really, you know, I, I was under the spout where the glory comes out because uh, Dr. Harris is a wonderful scholar and a, a tremendous uh, author and contributor to scholarship, particularly as it pertains to Afro-Pentecostalism and Afro-Pentecostal social justice. He's the author of Is Christianity the White Man's Religion? I had him on GPP uh, a year and a half or so ago to discuss his book when he first released it, maybe two years ago. So, um, uh, it's it's uh it's uh, uh Antipas was doing a, did a great job. Hey George Miller, you're on the road in route home from DC. Good, good, good. Thank you for weighing in. Thank you. I saw you and Sherry on the mentoring call this morning. Thank you so much for being there with uh, your bishop. Uh, I was all. I'm glad to see you. Um, I know that being home was a time of reflection and uh, prayer and and uh, and kind of uh, seeking the will of God. And I know that uh, that you will uh, receive it and carry it out to the fullest of your ability. All right. Not only did Antipas Harris do an incredible job at his plenary session, but but also yes, indeed, Loida. Uh, uh, Loida Martel uh, presented uh, on emergent diseases in a globalized world, the viral nature of racism. So here this Puerto Rican veterinarian PhD in theology, she is a veterinarian, a doctor of veterinary medicine and a PhD in theology. here she is explaining to us from both the hard sciences perspective and a theological philosophical perspective on the idea of the spreading of diseases, the earth, creation, theology, and our own self-care. It was a tremendous plenary presentation. I'm just highlighting the plenaries at this moment because there were too many workshops. I went to, I've been to about five or six workshops already. <laughs> she is Dabamba. That's right. Parabala Dabamba. She is Dabamba. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, so she was great. Of course, Frank Machia, who's been on GPP before. Wow. Two of the four plenary speakers this year have been on GPP, Antipas Harris and Frank Machia. Dr. Frank Machia uh, did a, a deep dive on yesterday on the cross and Pentecost beyond the Schleiermarker Bart divide. So there's these... Um, uh, theological, uh, philosophical uh, viewpoints on the cross and Pentecost, and and Frank Machia, who is a modern day theologian of the spirit, um, in my estimation, uh, uh, got four very very strong works on the spirit, and so um, and so uh, uh, Frank Machia did a plenary presentation on that struggle, uh, the theology uh, of Schleiermacher. Uh, uh, it's uh, and in comparative uh, uh, theology with um, with uh, Bart, and so uh, just he's just a whatever he says is gold anyway. Whatever comes out of his mouth is pure gold. So I'm grateful 
uh, for uh, Dr. Machia and his continued influence. He is a professor of theology here at Vanguard University, one of the plenary speakers uh, uh, there, okay? And then, of course, we began, uh, as soon as I got here on Thursday, uh, the second thing that I went to was the Alliance for Black Pentecostal Scholarship. It was our luncheon. And, um, and so I was a part of the, the alliance from the inception. And when I, uh, right before I got there, uh, uh, our president, uh, Dr. Clifton Clark, had called me the day before on Wednesday when I was coming into the city and asked me, hey, Jonathan, you were there at the beginning. Would you mind saying a word on the necessity and the, the, uh, the importance of Black Pentecostal scholarship? And so, um, you know, this is the Alliance for Black Pentecostal Scholars. And we were honoring three uh, Pentecostal scholars uh, to uh, post, uh, uh, posthumously. And so uh, we were able to do so, the late Dr. Leonard Lovett and uh, the late uh, Dr. Candace Shields and the late Dr. Uh, Joel Edwards and Dr. Joel Edwards, not the late Dr. Joel Edwards, but Dr. Joel Edwards. And so we were, we were uh, honoring them for their contributions to uh, Pentecostal scholarship. Leonard Lovett is the pioneer and the kind of, kind of gangster theologian that, that got black people in the society of Pentecostal studies. That's just the, the way that the history was uh, is. It's the truth. Um, our friend, uh, Dr. Harold Hunter, was in the session with us. And he's from the IPHC, the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. And he was there at the beginning, at the initial meeting in Dallas, Texas, uh, with Vincent Sinan and, and William Foppel and other Pentecostal scholars of the first generation. And he, Dr. Hunter, is of that generation. And he spoke uh, impromptu to share some historical insight and then, of course, Dr. Kim Alexander, my sister and friend, she's been on GPP before, uh, uh, spoke and, and just talked about the ways in which African-Americans have been integrated, however slowly, but however meaningfully, into the Society for Pentecostal Studies and her own interaction with, uh, with uh, Dr. Leonard Lovett, who is such a tremendous gift of grace to the entire theological enterprise, but Afro-Pentecostalism in particular. My friend Sammy Alfaro, who's been on GPP, did a great uh, 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 presentation. My friend Daniel uh, Isgrig, uh, who is the, um, uh, the uh, Holy Spirit Research Center at Oral Roberts University, he's the director of that center, uh, did a presentation on our brother, uh, Bishop Carlton, Carlton Pearson. And uh, he did a marvelous job. It was charitable. His presentation was charitable and historically accurate. His presentation called to question as well as affirmed good things. And uh, it was a it was a what a, a presentation or a paper or a lecture should do. It laid out the information as he had researched it and left conclusion drawing and questioning interrogation to the the audience that was there, the the the, the session audience. And so um, another colleague was supposed to respond to that. You know, you have presentation, sometimes you have a panel of respondents, or you have a series of presentations and a respondent to the presentations. And so he, he presented, and when I came in the door, um, he, uh, he, uh, he, when he stood up to make his presentation, he said, I'm so glad to see Dr. Alvarado here. Jonathan's my friend, and, and I'm going to call on him since the respondent that was scheduled to do it couldn't be there. So this is the second impromptu presentation I have to do. So I'm sitting there listening and taking notes and everything because I had to give a response because, of course, you know, I've known of and known Carlton Pearson for 30 years and uh, and used to play for Azusa Street East when he was doing the Azusa conferences, uh, East and West. And then, of course, the Azusa conference on the campus of ORU and the like. And so um, I played for him when he came to Atlanta. I want to be clear about that. Um, and, uh, and when he came to preach at like Church of Atlanta Lighthouse and things of that nature, I was there I'm working a musician. I was playing for the artist that was singing on that night. And so I have, I have relationship with, uh, not, I mean, I don't want to overstate it. I don't, I, I don't pick him up, pick him up the phone and call him. He didn't call me, but, but, um, but of course I know him as, as many of you all do. And I believe that he knows and recognizes me. The last time he saw me, he acknowledged me as if he knew. Me. Okay. So, uh, uh, my relationship with him, my study of him, my watching him, my relationship with people that know him, and uh, and the kind of fully orbed uh, circumference of being able to uh, being able to hear this perspective, this historical perspective and theological perspective that Daniel Iskrig brought to the table was just uplifting. It was charitable, though it was critical. He made some critical comment along that wise, but he was charitable. 
And the thing that I, I've come to discover is that oftentimes people are not charitable where Carlton Pearson is concerned. So thinking about that, it really, really stirred my heart again, uh, because I've prior to even knowing that he was doing this presentation, I was having some conversations with other brother bishops about uh, Carlton Pearson and their relationship with him and where he is now, what he's doing now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that was a great presentation. Just wanted to highlight that. Um, then uh, then uh, I participate, oh yes, um, uh, uh, Marcia Clark, who is the uh, co-chair of the uh, Practical Theology and Spiritual Formation Interest Group uh, chaired a session wherein Dara Delgado, Joy Qualls, and Anthony Roberts, uh, all three presented different at different times papers on various subjects. Uh, it was actually a, a book. I, 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 please, please forgive me. It was a book discussion. So each of them read Susan Morris's book called Calling in Context, Vocational Formation and Social Location which I want to encourage all of you to purchase. You have to pre-order it, but I want to encourage all of you to purchase it. Susan is here. She is the co-chair um, co of the Practical Theology and Spiritual Formation Interest Group for the Society of, for Pentecostal Studies. So she was there responding to the three of them, Dara Delgado, uh, Joy Qualls, and Anthony Roberts, all three friends, all three eminent scholars, tremendous gifts, wonderful people, just good people. And, uh, and they, uh, present, they, they presented their, their reading of Susan's work, presented it famously. It was just really, really wonderful, the way that they presented and the insights that we gained, their lenses and perspectives uh, through which they read her text on calling and vocation as it pertains to, I'll read the title again, calling in context vocational and uh, vocational formation and social location. So she uh, she really, really wrote about and they explored in her writing uh, this idea of call and this idea of social location, the place out of which one is called, the place that forms one as it pertains to the call, the hearing of the call within a particular context and the response to the call. And so they did a, they did just a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous job. And uh, I, I, I said I was going to die. All three of them are eminent scholars and um, and uh, all three, none of the three of them, none of the four of them. Uh, including Susan Morris, who wrote the book. Uh, none of the four of them have been on, on, on GPP, but uh, I, uh, I specifically asked uh, Dr. Joy Qualls, and she said she, of course, would come on. Anthony Roberts and I have had uh, a relationship because he's the book review editor for NUMA, the Journal for the Society for Pentecostal Studies. And of course, I've contributed a couple of book reviews while he's the, the editor, uh, has been the editor. And so we've interacted on a couple of occasions. So I think he'd be happy uh, to or would, would indulge me along that wise. Our sister and friend who's been on GPP a couple of times, uh, Dr. Kim Alexander, uh, did, a, uh, did a presentation called Reaching Out and Pressing Into New Contexts. Listen, Lessons from Interpretations of the Hemorrhaging Woman in Pentecostal history. And I took so many notes and my mind went in 15 different directions. And I said, oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm going to have Kim come talk about it. But when I preach it, y'all that are listening today need to act like it's the first time you ever heard it, because I'm going to say it like it is just, uh, I mean, my the last time I'm going to be able to preach. So many wonderful insights you gave. I'm not going to give them because you'll hear them again. All right. All right. Good. So then, uh, on yesterday, uh, oh, I was so torn on yesterday because of all people, Lester Ruth, celebrated liturgiologist and uh, worship theologian, was here, and he was he was watch this. He was uh, lecturing on gave a a, a a paper on silver head liturgical revolutionary Judson Cornwall's critical role in disseminating Pentecostal praise and worship. So Judson Cornwall was one of the early ones in the 80s that we were reading to be oriented to praise and worship. Judson Cornwall and I shared a platform at uh, Christ Church under David Ireland when David Ireland uh, brought Judson Cornwall to be the, the main speaker at their uh, worship fest that they used to do in the 90s. And so uh, I met Judson Cornwall then and... Um, 
his sister, the celebrated evangelist, whose name escapes me, who I met when I was a child. She used to come to preach at the Redeemer Church in Columbus, Ohio, where I was raised. And her name is Iverna Tompkins. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Iverna Tompkins is Justin Cornwall's sister and used to come and preach. And so I've known their family. I met Justin Cornwall in the 90s. I met her in the early 80s, perhaps even the late 70s. My mother and father used to take us out to those kind of things. And so I just say these things to you to say it was a very full circle thing that Lester Ruth, who I've used in my own work, his work I've used in my own in terms of liturgiology. My master of theology is in worship and liturgics and my doctor of ministry is in uh, blended worship. And so I've used his work in, in my work and, uh, and then, uh, and then for him to be presenting on Judson Cornwall, who I've met, who I've made his acquaintance, and uh, and uh, have sat under him directly in worship teaching and the like, and then modeled some of our own liturgiology after what he did in in the kind of contemporary praise and worship movement as one of the first theologians of the movement from a charismatic perspective. And so I I was so torn because at the same time that he was presenting. Uh, uh, Kwabena uh, Gyadu from Trinity Theological Seminary in Ghana was presenting, and I'm a, I'm a fanboy. Uh, his work has influenced mine greatly on African Pentecostalism. And so he's a Ghanaian man who is just a tremendous, he's the president of the seminary there and a scholar, an eminent scholar. And so I was like, oh, I can't be in two places at once. And so I, I, I flipped a coin and I ended up with, with uh, Gyadu. And uh, I enjoyed that presentation and the two other presentations, uh, another by Sana Irvas, uh, who's at the Wabash uh, College, Wabash Center for Teaching uh, right now. And she did a thing on Pentecostal Mariology and problematic purity requirements for girls, how to protect girls' rights. While uh, uh, Gyadu did, I decree, I declare, and I call it done an African perspective on orality and the study of Pentecostal charismatic theology. So we talked about the narratival dimensions of Pentecostal spirituality, how we decree and declare a thing and how our narrative for African spirituality is on par with this research based uh, kind of uh, propositional theology that comes out of the Western European tradition. And so um, uh, he, he took Frank Macchio to task and saying that, you know, Frank Macchio said that um, that that uh, that uh, a narrative theology is not uh, is not uh, constructive and a propositional theology. But um, Gyadu said, but it needs to be taken seriously in the constructing of theology. And so that that whole that whole piece there was was incredible. And yes, so both Kim Alexander's piece on the hemorrhaging woman and uh, uh, Susan Irvas's piece on uh, Marianology were both, they were they were collateral, though they were in two different sections. And so they were really, really complementary one to the other. And it was fascinating to see how other faith traditions, uh, Muslims and uh, Hindi and others, uh, view some of the uh, the purity uh, prohibitions concerning women, I'm, and I'm, again, I'm not going. To, I'm not going to preview uh, what what uh, some people are going to hear at some point or another. I guarantee you, will hear that again, because it was just marvelous. I need to research it out, think it through, pray it, pray it out, and uh, and be able to uh, articulate it in a way that uh, that does not come come off. Um, when a man does something on Mary or on women or on women's purity issues. Uh, if, unless the man is a fool, the man has to be very sensitive, very in touch, very in tune, um, and, uh, and has to do a lot more listening than talking. So that's what I plan to do because I felt very strongly that it's a message that a man needs to champion on behalf of sisters. Because it's one thing for the women to say some things because they're supposed to say that because they're women. But it's another thing for men to enter into the liberative fight and say, our sisters are still being oppressed in these ways, and we need to be able to do something about it. As a man, I need to step to the table and do something about it. Okay, and so it's a part of my egalitarian work as a as a bishop in the Lord's Church and as a Morehouse man. Um, yeah, we're egalitarian and I believe in women at every station of leadership. All right, all right. Well, it's ten thirty three, y'all. Many of y'all came on with me at the front at the outset. I'm on the road. I will be on the road through the weekend. I'm back on the road again on Monday. I've got to go and do a pastors and leaders conference. Dr. Tony and I both uh, Monday through Wednesday. So we'll be out uh, 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 sharing and leading and, and, and growing and learning ourselves. And, um, and so uh, I would that uh, you all pray for us. 
Keep us lifted up in prayer for traveling mercies. Uh, we have I've done planes, trains, automobiles, and buses. I'll tell you that story at another time. Uh, well, it might it might be funny uh, for you to hear. I haven't ridden uh, a Greyhound like bus. Uh, other than like church trips with people I know, like getting on a bus, a Greyhound bus with total strangers, I haven't done that in, I can't tell you the last time I did. And uh, it's not that I, I don't disparage that. It's a great mode of transportation. But my happy hip showed up in San Diego, California this morning at 5.30 a.m. Uh, for to catch my bus. I, I, I catch my train at, at 5 o'clock, actually. That's when I showed up to catch my train. Only to discover that I didn't purchase a train ticket. I purchased a transportation ticket. And the transportation that was coming out of the San Diego Amtrak so and so so and so so and so whatever the long name of the station was was uh, was a motor coach, in other words, a Greyhound like bus. And so I stood in line with the rest of the Saints, and uh, and as they were clicking us in and, and checking our our boarding pass, whatever, making sure we had paid, and I sat my happy hips on the bus and rode up from San Diego. So I flew out on an airplane. I took a train down to San Diego. I took a bus back here and I've been Ubering the entire time I've been in town. I have been on planes, trains, buses, and automobiles the entire time. Y'all pray for, for your bishop's safety. Pray, because I've had every, uh, the next, I feel like I'm going to step out in the lobby downstairs and there's going to be a mule or something down there getting ready to take me over to the meeting. So y'all pray for me because I've been traveling every kind of way that I can travel. And I love you right back, each and every one of you. Y'all are so kind to me and so, so gracious in coming on. Listen, if you are inc so inclined, meet me on tonight. Meet me on tonight, friends, for uh, meet me on tonight for uh, GPP late. It'll be a late edition of GPP. OK, so meet me on tonight. If you are so inclined, I would be most grateful if you would do so. I need your presence. I need your support. I need you to share, to like, and to subscribe. I need you to let other people know about GPP. I need you to, um, and I, I can't tell you, just keep your, just keep noticing and looking and all that kind of stuff, because I will be on tonight at some point, but I would that you all would, um, would, uh, would track with me and let me know that you're there and uh, encourage others to join the GPP family and the GPP community. So that way we can, we can, uh, so that way we can continue to advance Pentecostal scholarship. Here's the thing, y'all. While walking around the meeting here, the Society for Pentecostal Studies here in Costa Mesa, California, at um, at uh, at uh, Vanguard University here in uh, Costa Mesa, more and more people are walking up to me. People that I do not know. <laughs> Y'all see my, my, my wife. My wife don't have no sense. She talking about you have a bus ministry. That's it. Something wrong with you, woman. I don't know. I do not have a bus ministry. Thank you very much. Uh, Lord have mercy. But I rode one day. I called my wife from the bus. I told her, this is where I am, baby. This is where I am. Hallelujah to God. Uh, you know, I, I just feel like I got to go where God sends me. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, but listen, friends, uh, um, people are walking up to me in this thing, and, and they are grateful for, appreciative of, and engaged with the global Pentecostal perspectives. People from Canada, people from Europe, and people from South America, people from all over the planet that are viewing, that are interested in Pentecostal themes, are tapped into this Pentecostal network. So what we have to do, the interest that is there has to be uh, the broadcast has to be more widely proliferated because there's, there's more interest beyond the borders of what we've been able to do thus far. So I want to encourage each and every one of you to share with others, to pro publicize the broadcast in some kind of way. And if you are so inclined, will you help me by donating to Global Pentecostal Perspectives? Will you help me by making a, a gift, a donation of some, some sort that will help us to continue to do the work that we've been assigned to do? at the nexus of the church, the academy, and the culture. This is the, the, the nexus, the tridactic nexus out of which we theologize. And I would that you would help me with that. I'd be most appreciative if you would. I'm grateful for you as my uh, 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 GPP community. Y'all are my th thoughtful, engaged community that helps me to think through matters and helps to spread this kind of Pentecostalism that perhaps is the world is calling for in this hour. This is the season, I believe, for Pentecostals and Pentecostal scholarship to emerge and to come forth in ways that perhaps it has not done in its first two generations of the modern Pentecostal era. Please, ma'am, please, well, there's more than two generations. Modern Pentecostal scholarship 
this I'm a, I believe to be a, that I'm a part of the third wave of modern Pentecostal scholarship that began in the 50s. So I misspoke not of the Pentecostal movement, the modern Pentecostal era that began all the way in 1906. So we're, we're about the se seventh generation or so of that. But I'm talking about modern Pentecostal scholarship, which began in the first you know, PhDs and, and, and those that really took uh, Pentecostalism seriously from it as an academic discipline started to emerge in some numbers back then, not just scholars of Pentecostalism, people that were outside of the tradition that looked into the tradition to study it, but I'm talking about Pentecostal scholars, Pentecostals who believed in the intellectual love of God, who went on to do PhDs and doctorates and other things to, to and so I'm a part of the third wave of that. And so you help to make the broadcast and the expanse of that ministry and the expanse of that wave to continue to go forward through your kind and generous support in the way that you promote, share the broadcast, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and, and get notifications and all the, and the like, and the way that you support through donations. I wanna encourage you to do so on today. It's always a blessing. Uh, so many of you, several of you, not so many, it's not an overwhelming number, but several of you, thank you, took the challenge to uh, become platinum donors. That means you're going to donate $1,200 over the course of 2022. Some of you all are doing that by doing uh, $100 a month, and I'm grateful for you for doing that. And uh, others of you that are, are doing that are, are going to just give a $1,200 donation or $600 at one time and $600 at another time. The giving mechanisms are on your screen. They're scrolling. I would, that however you want to do it and whatever amount you want to support, it would be greatly appreciated. I'm thankful to each and every one of you for how you think about and regard GPP and Dr. Jonathan Alvarado as the uh, kind of the main spokesperson for uh, GPP. Stay with us. Uh, Look for us on tonight and uh, and stay with us, track with us, because I'm going to be having, as this as I meet with all my friends out here, I'm, I'm rekindling connections that I haven't had in two years and making ready some more wonderful, wonderful inter interviews and conversations that we could have the next time we gather on Global Pentecostal. I got to slow down my speech because my computer moves so slow, this internet won't pull up my stuff, my digital assets. I'll try it again on global Pentecostal perspectives.